You mute? Are we live? Well, we're missing one. Brandon disappeared on us, but uh, welcome to Let's Talk About It. All right. Tonight, we're here just to talk about some things that are going on in the world, especially when it comes to uh, uh, the recent events uh, with George Floyd and and all the things happening there in, in Minneapolis, but it's also affecting all of our local communities. And we're going to talk about those things here on Let's Talk About It. So we're just waiting to, uh, we're going live here. And I'm just, uh, uh, hold on, <laughs> turn my phone down. Uh, just waiting for some people to join with us. We're going to be, we're going to start at 7 p.m. So we've got Antonio Medina is watching. Liera Gavin's watching all the way from uh, from out in Arizona. But we want to welcome uh, everybody tonight. Mariana's here. Uh, just says hello to everyone. Uh, Caitlin is now watching. So we're starting to pick people up. Um, yeah, Liera just shared a stream. That's a good idea. So all you guys that are watching and you're on here, uh, there's 26 of you. Leave us a comment and um, and share it. Go ahead and just share it. While we're waiting right now to get started, go ahead and share what's going on. I'm looking here. There we go. We're going to start here in just a, a couple minutes. But leave us a comment. Um, yeah, I'm going to do uh, intros here in just in just a, a second. Um, <clears throat> but if you have a question tonight, if you're watching on Facebook, you can leave me a comment, and I can't guarantee we're going to answer all of your questions, but we're going to try to answer some of those questions. Um, and so we'll try to let your voice be heard as well. So just leave me a question. If you have a particular question or one for a particular individual, go ahead and uh, ask me. We have Natalie Williams all the way from New York. Got Stephanie. Welcome, Stephanie. We got German is with us. Iris is with us. So we're starting to get some people. I believe that uh, we're going to have a lot of people watching what we're doing tonight. Let me see if I can. But it's good to have everybody tonight. Let me, uh, let's go ahead and we got about just a minute here. Okay. One minute, and then we're going to go ahead and get started. We got uh, another person from New York City. I don't know how to say your name. Renu, R-E-N-U. Um, Faith is from New York City watching us. Um, but we want to welcome everybody. We want to welcome you tonight to Let's Talk About It. And tonight, uh, we have several with us, and when I call your name, you can kind of just wave at him. But first we have Brandon Smith. Brandon is a youth pastor right here at Living Water Fellowship and has a lot of family that actually live right there just within houses, I guess, from, from pretty much from where all this is taking place. And uh, we have uh, several of our pastor's council. This actually started probably from a pastor's council meeting we had this past Saturday. And so um, we want to uh, uh, welcome our pastor's council. We got several of those members. We have Kent Borkland. He is here with us. He's a director of revenue management for a corporation. We have Michael Smith, who is the owner of Smitty's Auto, but also, as I said, on our pastor's council. We have Mark Peters that's on our pastor's council, and he's also a realtor 
and property manager. And then we have Chaplain Dan Rivera. He's a master chaplain with International Conference of Police Chaplains, also honorary chaplain with the Osceola County Sheriff's Department. And that's actually where I got to meet him from. And uh, so I invited him to uh, just join in with us as well. So we're going to open in prayer, but I just wanted to remind you to, if you would like to ask a question once we get started, uh, just go ahead and put that in the comment section if you're on Facebook. Uh, that's the only place that I can uh, do that with Facebook. So, uh, but anyway, let's open in prayer. Lord, I pray tonight that something that we may say, something that we may do here tonight, might cause someone just to simply change their mind about how they see the situation that is going on right now. God, I know that just in just in the past few days, uh, my eyes have been opened even more uh, than than before. Lord, I pray that we walk away with here away from here with a passion to understand that. Every change has got to start with us, each one of us tonight. So, Lord, just open our hearts and open our minds tonight. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, again, we want to just welcome you tonight to let's talk about it. All right. Um, I see we still got a, a few starting to keep joining in with us. Martin Garcia's here. Connie's here. Pastor Marshall is here. So we see a lot and we just want to welcome you again tonight. Um, you know, as I've said in my prayer, you know, my eyes have been opened up even, even so much more uh, this week. You know, I've never had a conversation with my son about what happens when a policeman pulls you off what you've got to do in order to survive a police check. Never once have I had that conversation. And, and I know that, you know, with a, a lot of people that is not dark skinned, you know, everyone on our call tonight is, is not African American or American black, but, but we have Jamaican and, and, and we have Mark, uh, which I never remember where Mark is from but from another country, all right? But it's all the same because of our skin tone or our skin color, it seems like, and, and I believe statistics prove it, that you're more apt to get arrested for something that I might get by with. And we, we certainly seen this play out on, on TV and on video of where George Floyd is killed by a police officer that has a knee on his neck. Now, there was nothing that George Floyd did that would deserve a death sentence, but yet he did. And so many people, I watch different videos of people being jerked out of the cars or doing whatever and, and being racially profiled. All I'm saying is I haven't experienced a racial profiling. And so sometimes it's a little bit hard for me to relate. And I think for a lot of uh, Caucasian people that it's, it's hard to relate to something that you have never, ever experienced. But to anybody that's got uh, a darker color skin has felt that. And I want to talk about some of that tonight. I think that we just got to talk about it. If, if we're going to uh, change things, then it's got to start in our own mind, in our own hearts. And so I, I've got a question that I want to throw out there tonight just to get us started is how do you process that? Um, you know, Brother Mark, I'm a, we'll just start with you. H how do you process what is going on, you know, even with George Floyd, but you've seen it so many times. You've seen it, you know, all of your life. How do you process that? Well, from the times that, you know, I've been exposed to this, you know, I came to the United States 
when I was 15 and in the 80s. And, you know, racism wasn't something that, you know, you always think of. And I'm from Guyana originally. And it was brown and black. Mostly that's the population in Guyana. And there was racism there too. You know, it's it wasn't necessarily a white and black thing, but coming to the United States and <clears throat> living here, you know, there have been times I've had incidents with law enforcement um, in New York City. And, you know, it, it sometimes it, you don't realize that you've been mistreated, how bad it was until you reflect back on it and you, you're reminded of when you see what happened with Floyd, and Mr. Floyd this past week, of the pain that is still there inside of you that you've been affected, but you have brushed it off and you've moved on. And then the next incident you brush off and you keep moving on. And then you realize that you're hurting inside. And the pain just is there, it doesn't go away. And you begin to be controlled by your emotions. And sometimes it gets the best of you. And I think in all the incidents that's happened where you see, and you know, it's you're easy to discount when it's another race against another race, like just a regular person, you know, having racism. But when you see someone in authority who's supposed to protect, serve, you know, protect, honor, you know, be, you know, be there for us to keep us safe, and they're the one that's hurting us, it causes such a rise in you that you feel so weak, you feel so that you don't know who to turn to. And, you know, quick story, when I was younger in New York, you know, they were, we were just hanging out with our friends in the back playing cards. We weren't doing anything. We weren't making noise. We were just having, you know, we were teenagers. And a bunch of cops came in. They were all white at the time. And they all came in, like five or six of them, and they just started roughing us up and calling us names, calling us, you know, some words that I don't want to repeat here. And we were like, we didn't do anything. Why are you even here? No one called. Did, did someone call? No, we are responding to something in the area and we saw that you guys were back here. So they just came. I mean, it was something that it left a trauma inside of you that you didn't realize that it's there still and eats at you. And how do we process this? And when you look back at all the things that have been happening, it's, it's really emotional when I get to talking about it. And I don't want to keep, I don't want this to keep happening to others as well. You know, I have my son and this is pastor said, you don't think of telling, he don't think of telling his son, but I have to think of telling my son and my daughter, when you're pulled over, how you're to behave. I hope they, they're raised the right way in a sense of they respect those in authority. But even with respect and those in authority, there's still a fear. My daughter was pulled over in New York City in sitting in the back of a car by, and my, my, my wife was there, my mom was in the car, and my brother-in-law was driving. And my daughter and everyone in the car was in so much fear of this sheriff coming up, this police officer coming up to the car. So it, how do we deal with it? I hope this discussion here is the start of how we bring healing first, because that's where it starts. Amen. Brother Mike, tell me how you process that. And have you had that conversation? Your sons are older, they're married and obviously driving a car. Uh, have you had that conversation with your sons? Um, yes, I did. Um, and it is really not a good conversation to have because you know it's actually real. It's, it's, it's a real life experience where because of the pigmentation of your skin, you're ostracized. And if you're not in our skin, you really cannot identify with that. You know, I've been pulled over many times before and I've pulled up, been pulled over to a white policeman. I've been pulled over by, you know, a black policeman and there is this there is this fear that comes over you when you're driving and there is a police light in the back of your rear, rear view mirror 
and you can't you can't help you can't help but feel fearful it, 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 am i going to be shot tonight what is my experience going to be right now with this uh, this police pulling me over and <clears throat> i have tried my best all my life to live a, a, a decent good life and talk to people with respect but i've had this experience with this policeman a few years ago and he pulled me over and i did everything that was you know that i'm supposed to do, keep hands on the steering and answer his questions and you know i remember i said to him you know officer i have a clean driver's license you know i haven't gotten a ticket in years and he riled up and he said you know it's about time you get a ticket and I'm thinking, and he said that just to see what would happen now, what I would do to respond. And I drove away from that that um, pullover feeling almost worthless because it didn't merit him to speak to me like that. I'm a citizen just like him, just like anybody else, you know? I, I, and I don't understand why he did that. Um, for you to see, a black man on the uh, for you to see a black man on the ground with a white policeman knee in his neck, and there is nothing anybody could do because he is the law. You can't push him off. Nobody could push him away from the guy because then you would be interfering with the law. And to see this guy sit on this man's neck in such a way. It hurts. It really hurts. And there's nothing you can do. And when I look at that, I see my three boys. I see my daughter. It could be any one of them. And for what? What was what was what was this man doing that that merits him being killed on the street just like that? You, you wouldn't even treat an animal like that. Nobody would treat a dog like that on the street. And the guy was just here in with his knees in the guy's neck like nothing was happening. It hurts. And I believe, and I believe, I'm kind of glad that it's not just black people that is demonstrating today or protesting today. But when I look into the, the pro, uh, look into the crowd, there's so much white people, you know, that's actually um, protesting. And I believe that our country is at a point now where enough is enough we can't do this anymore we can't just have our young black men being killed in the street by the people say the very police people policemen that's supposed to be protecting us every time my phone ring at the night i'm thinking is any of my boys in trouble it's not right it is just not right and one of my biggest concern you know is that the world has to do what they what they, what they need to do but what I've seen over the years is that when things like this happen, you find that the, the black church go and they protest and the black people protest. But I would say this, I would say it, until, until we see the white pastors of our nation that consider themselves child and children of the living God, going forward, going before us, taking the mantle and going before us, even in demonstration, when our white pastors begin to show that concern that this is enough, we cannot afford to have our black brothers being killed in the street anymore, then I think we will see a change. We will see a difference. But until, because it's not something that the black people can, can stop. We can't do this. Amen. I think that <clears throat> somewhere along the line, we've got to say enough is enough. Um, we've been watching, you know, let me just say that I think that sometimes we can think this is not our problem. This didn't happen in Poinciana or this didn't happen in Kissimmee. So it's not our problem because this happened in Minneapolis. So it's halfway across the United States or better. So, or it happened in California or it happened somewhere else. So it's not my problem. I think that that's part of the problem 
is when we think that it's not our problem. Exactly. Um, let me uh, ask Pastor Brandon about uh, this destruction of property. There's been a, uh, I mean, we've watched it unfold all over the United States and places are getting burnt down, cars are getting burnt up. Um, do you think, how's that affecting the message? Let's ask it that way. How, how do you feel uh, that's affecting the message or is it? So real quick, um, yeah, I grew up in, in Minnesota and uh, for a period of time, we lit, this incident happened on 38th in Chicago and my house was on 52nd in Chicago. Uh, we used to go to a church across the street um, to do choir stuff, Bible quiz stuff. And then we used to go into that store, Cup Foods, and get little uh, little Debbies and, and snacks and stuff like that. My church we had, went to was on 38th and 1st. So um, this is my, my neighborhood. And, and before I even address that, uh, I've I got to say, because obviously we, we, we all say that it could have been our family and whatnot, and, and it could have, but since it's my, my neighborhood, my family, uh, it le legit could have been my family. And uh, I get emotional when I, when I think about that every time. I mean, I, I thank God, but I mean, that is my family, right? I mean, that's my brother. I mean, it could have been my dad. It could have been one of my brothers. It could have been my uncle, a, a cousin, a, a friend, but George Floyd was someone significant other he was someone's father as we learned he's someone's brother someone's son someone's friend and I, and I think about that and I think about I, obviously I was mad I was frustrated I was upset I was angered um when I seen the video Tuesday morning but then I was concerned as well and we they just talked about how as as a as a child you're you're coached and you're told how to respond to officers and I remember my father telling us how to respond to officers but just the other day, I had to tell my dad himself. I had to tell him, listen, pops, like you're going to work in the middle of the night. There's a curfew. He's like, yeah, I got a letter, whatnot. I keep it in my visor. I said, dad, no. I said, tape that, tape that letter to the steering wheel. Don't make any sudden movements. Say, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Whatever you got to do, don't make any sudden movements. And it hit me and it hurt because now since I have been taught that, now I'm telling my, my dad who's in his 50s, I'm like, pops, don't make any sudden movements. And I'm like, that that shouldn't be happening like that. It shouldn't be happening like that. But when it comes to the destruction of property and it comes to that, it, it one, you got to understand that it's not just people of the community that's doing it. Now, I get it. There's some people in the community that are doing it, but it's not just people that are from our community that are doing the destruction of the property or or rioting and throwing um, cocktail bombs and into businesses and stuff. I got to, once again, my family's there. So I'm hearing it straight from them of how their stores have been uh, destroyed or ransacked and and everything's broken inside and, and not not a whole lot missing, but just destroyed and like for what? And then a, a shop down the street from my brother's barbershop gets, gets thrown some cocktail bottles into it catching it on fire just a few nights ago. So my brother's out there with, with his neighborhood watch people and they're out there literally patrolling because it's groups that are coming into the state and groups from outside of the community that are actually doing this. Now I get it, like it's, there's people in our community that are doing it. Um, and, and in that, like I believe that it's, it's not necessarily silencing what the issue is. Um, and, and here's why I believe that, like, I don't agree with looting. I don't, I don't agree with that. And I don't agree, agree with, you know, stealing. I never have, I mean, biblical mandate of thou shalt not steal. I get it. Um, and I, and I trust that and I hold on to that, but here's the thing, like for so long, and y'all got to hear me <clears throat> for so long, like the, the voice of the oppressed people, the African-American, the black people has been suppressed and has been silenced. And, and I was thinking about this and there's holes in this, in this analogy and I get it. And, and I'm talking to my mentor. He's been walking me through it, but I just started thinking about this the other day and bear with me. Like, like I'm not minimizing the black community to being like a child. Don't, don't, don't get it. Don't get like that. Don't, don't say Pastor Brandon's doing that and he's comparing it to a child. But Jesus, when he spoke, he, he would speak in terms of saying, unless you become like a child then this and that or whatnot. So um, I was just thinking about my son Kingston and, and he's a five-year-old. And, and my son, say my son, what he has done is he's come up to and said, dad, I want to tell you something. Something's going on in my life or I'm hurting or dad, I want to show you my Legos. Dad, I want to show you this. I'm going to show you that or whatever. And I'm like, I'm so enamored with what 
going on in my life. I'm reading a book. I'm reading in the newspaper. I'm watching sports or I'm in my phone. Whatever it is that I'm doing, I'm so concerned about what I'm doing that Kingston's like, Dad, I really want to show you this. And then at that, Kingston runs away. I say, I'll see it in a minute. He goes away, comes back in 10 minutes. Says, Dad, I really want to show you this. And, and Dad, I want to tell you this. Or Dad, hey, I got to talk to you about this. And then I don't respond. I say, Kingston, I told you I'll see it in a minute. And then he comes back 15 minutes later. He's like, Dad, I really want to show you this. Dad, you're not listening to me. I want to show you this. Can you see this? Look, look right here. And even tries to push my screen down, tries to put my paper down, push my, my book down. And then I'm like, Kingston, I told you I'll come see you in a minute. I'll come see it in a minute. And then he walks away. And then about 10 minutes later, I started hearing Kingston yelling. I started hearing him crying. I started hearing him throwing stuff in his room. I started hearing him, him, him um, knocking stuff over and, and doing whatever he's doing in his room. But I go check on Kingston. And I'm like, Kingston, what are you doing, man? And I'm like, what's wrong with you? And he's like, Dad, it seems like the only time that I have your attention is when I'm doing something I shouldn't be doing. And that's the only time I have your attention. And, and that's the only time that you want to pay attention to me is when I'm, I'm knocking stuff over, when I'm yelling. And then I have your full attention. And, and my a mentor helped coach me through this and he's like you know there's consequences to that right I'm like absolutely there's consequences to that and and there's consequences to Kingston doing that just like there's consequences to, to people looting if they get caught there's consequences to people burning stuff up when they get caught there's consequences to it or whatnot but the thing that you gotta understand is this I don't believe that the that the that the topic is being suppressed if anything it's being brought to light now even more now than ever and here's why because People are believing that that the risk of the consequence um, is is does not exceed what reward can come on the outside of it. If I can get your ear and I can get your attention by something that I'm doing, just like my son is thinking, if I can get your attention by the way that I'm acting or by making some noise or whatnot, then I'm going to do it. If I can go make some noise in the street and protest and hold up signs and yell and whatnot to get your ear, then guess what? I'm going to do it. And I believe that's what's happening. And now we're seeing how, how one of the first times in history, one of the first, if not the first, uh, all 50 states in the United States of America have been in protest or have done some type of protest across the country in the past nine days. So I don't believe that it's suppressed the voice by by no means. If anything, the voice is being heard and justice is getting it's starting to take place, but it's a process. It's not something that can happen overnight and we're learning that, but now the voice is being heard. Amen. Let me read a, a couple comments. Barbara Mitchell says, well the Protesters be heard if there was not some destruction to wake up the attention of the political leaders. You know, um, I saw another post here. Give me just a second. Wow, got a lot of posts going on. But uh, it, it was it was about about when uh, George was hollering for his mother that every black mother in America heard her son at that particular moment. You know, um, I mean, that's the worst thing you want to hear, right? On national TV or on some video of your son crying out for help and you can't, <coughs> you, excuse me, that you can't reach out because of that. I think there's a, <coughs> a systematic racism that seems to be going on in America. Chaplain Dan, can you tell us about that? What is systematic racism? You figure out how to unmute yourself? There you go. Do you hear me? Yes. Do you hear the question? Could you repeat the question again, Pastor? With the racism in America, it's been going on, I mean, almost since the birth of America, right? So uh, it's a systematic racism. How would you define that? Well, it, it's interesting because I come with a perspective. I'm listening to my brothers. I come from a perspective where I've experienced um, what we see as racism or prejudice from not only being Hispanic, being Latino, but I've experienced it from my own um, culture, 
I experienced him from black because they, I was I'm considered mulatto. Uh, so I experienced him from white, black, and Hispanic. And maybe because of my my uh, experience as a law enforcement, I'm retired law enforcement. I, I did uh, 30 years. I was a law enforcement officer in New York. I was uh, started my career in New York State, uh, out in Long Island in 1980. I was stationed at the barracks at Jones Beach. Uh, then I worked in the city. Uh, and from there, um, I came here to the city of Kissimmee in Florida, been here over 30 years. And I retired from the city of Kissimmee Police as well as the Yasio County Sheriff's Office. So I come in with that perspective, but one of the things I've learned growing up, because even as a teenager, I was um, 13 years old and I almost was killed in Boston when I was marching for the rights of blacks and Latinos for fair housing. So I was a young, I was 12 going on 13, a young boy, teenager, marching in the civil rights. Um, so I understand uh, when people say, you know, systemic racism. And when we look at that word systemic racism, what we're saying is, is that, that there is a culture, there is something deeply rooted within our institutions, not just in the police departments, but within the very institution. And as a former pastor, I pastored three churches as well. Um, it, it just takes me, Pastor, to what the Bible talks about and what the Bible teaches us that racism, prejudice, et cetera, we know that's sin. And we know that sin, the violation of God's law, God's commandment. We look for justice in Amos chapter five, especially that where they said, let justice roll down like a mighty stream. And when we look at, we're looking for justice, when we know that the very foundation, according to the Bible, according to Psalms, when we look at Psalms 89, et cetera, that the very foundation of God's righteousness and holiness is, is justice. But the, 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 when we try to define these terms, it, it, and it could be, I know before you and I were talking at some time, but um, it, it could be subjective because systemic, if you're talking to a politician, they have the definition of it. If you talk to pastors, different pastors they might have. But I've known what it is to link arms with um, all races, to march for, quote unquote equality and for and for justice and for what's right. And and the thing is, is that this is uh, as also as a chaplain, because I've chosen to, after I retired and work with the police departments as a chaplain, because I did community policing from New York and here. And community policing for me was not for me to patrol the com in the community. Community policing for me was I work with the community. Together we work as one to identify what problems are and together to solve those problems. Because our community knows who are the ones that want to start trouble. The memory of Mr. Floyd cannot be diminished nor eradicated because the news media now is focusing on the mayhem and the looting and the destruction. That's not protest. Uh, and that's not, I know what protest is, like some of my brothers probably do, because I've marched in it from New York and here. And you and Terry Pastor, you and I, Pastor, you and I walked on, I believe, Monday. Uh, and it was peaceful. And we made our voices heard to the chief of police and others and our city officials that were walk, walk, walking with us. And we're letting them heard. And I don't want the memory of Mr. Floyd and the memory of so many others so many others that uh, we've seen uh, being brutalized, even murdered uh, because of this racism and prejudice. And then we just focusing on the destruction and the mayhem. And we forget that this is not the memory of a man that was killed. This is not how his legacy or who will want us to behave. And I believe that our focus and attention should be on exactly what happened. And we, if we start going into why did it happen, I think we all could come up with various conclusions. But I believe the important thing is I, I look at it from a, 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 from a perspective as being a police officer or law enforcement for 30 years and retired as a pastor of three churches um, and as a, a master chaplain working with uh, the sheriff's office, as well as with the city police. 
and also as a uh, one that is involved in our community. So I see this perspective and I said, okay, what can we do as the church, Pastor, how you asked me, what can the church do in a position like this? I believe this is a wake up call to the church because you and I know, and my brothers here, we know that there are forces that are beyond these individuals. There are forces that are beyond that, that is in the spiritual realm for we fight not against flesh, right? Blood and, and flesh and blood. So we know what is prompting this. And because what we know what is prompting and what is steering and what is encouraging this, but there is an authority and a power we have as the children of God that if we start exercising, the church begins to exercise the authority that was given to us, delegated authority given by Jesus Christ, the Lord God Almighty, has given us the authority and power when the church rises up and becomes the church. And in my lifetime, I hope I see it. I have four grandbabies and I'm sure I'm talking to the choir, but I want my grandchildren. I believe you preface it at the beginning of all this, the conversation you have with your children. I had that conversation with my grandson who's driving and my other grandson will be driving about what to do because I've been stopped numerous times in the city of St. Cloud uh, driving at night. And I instructed my children what to do. Make sure both hands are on the steering wheel. Make sure you leave your hands on the steering wheel. Make sure you say yes and no, sir. And that you, if you have a weapon in the vehicle in the glove compartment, that you let them know, et cetera, et cetera. But I went through all that with them. And I think when we look at what's happening, it's, we know it's a condition of the heart, but now this is opening up a conversation like my brother, I believe, I don't know if it was Brother Brandon or one of the brothers, but it's opening up a conversation in all 50 states. And I pray to God that now this momentum that we can have a very productive conversation. All right. Um, I was looking, trying to watch some of the comments at the same time I'm listening. And somebody made a comment, you know, we talked a little bit about it, but basically people stood around and watched when they all should have jumped in and stopped them instead of just watching. Kent, I wonder sometimes if we're guilty of watching from afar, but we're just watching. If, if we say that this is not our problem, this is not our issue, because it's not in our town, are we guilty of standing by and watching? I think you're absolutely right. I think it's easy to be a spectator and harder to be a, a participator and, 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 you know, and a participant in, in, in the solution. And uh, you know, it, it's unfortunate, you know, unless you've walked in those shoes, unless you've lived the life of a, a, a person of color, it's hard to fully engage in, and, and relate to the, the pain that they're going through right now. And uh, I think this has been a wake up call for everyone that the pain is real. You know, what really hit me was the other day when we had a conversation and I've known brother Mike and, and brother Mark for, for years. And, uh, you know, they're always very happy and positive people and you think everything is great. Uh, and then you realize that there are issues underneath that they choose not to share. Uh, and you, you wake up to the fact that everyone uh, thinks you're fine, but there are issues that we need to deal with. And, uh, and I think what we're trying to do here is have a conversation and, and not just to act like everything is fine when it's not. We've got to start with an understanding. And uh, I think, you know, I'm not trying to speak for all Caucasian people, but I think a lot of times there's a deafening silence. And I don't know if it's true or not, but I suspect a lot of them just don't know what to say. And sure, there are some that don't agree or, or choose to be silent because it's not my problem. But a lot of times, it's uh, you don't know what, what you can say that, that can help or what we can do to help. And, and I think it has to start with engaging in a community of people who don't look the same as you. I can say this, that you know, being part of a multicultural uh, fellowship has absolutely changed my life. You know, I came from Europe and... Uh, 
the first person I saw was a prize fighter named Floyd Patterson, if anyone remembers him who was a black man, and I saw him on a flight over and uh, shook his hand and got his autograph. That was the first person I had seen in the flesh who was a black man, other, other than watching people on TV. So I had no exposure at all. And when I immigrated, I immigrated to, uh, you know, to Nebraska, a town of 400 people. And the only black person in that whole county was a little girl that was adopted uh, by a family. So I had no exposure to that at all. And uh, only what you see in, in media and uh, or what you, you know, listen to radio, you know, black music and inspired art and so on. But coming to Florida changed all that and coming and becoming part of a multicultural uh, church has changed all that. It's to the point now where I, I will sometimes, you know, go on vacation up north and and go to a different church and something doesn't feel right. And it doesn't strike me at first until I realize it's because this church doesn't have the color I'm used to seeing. And, you know, that's it. Great feeling to be able to say that because I feel more at home with people who are different than me than I do, uh, you know, just sitting around with people who look the same as me. But saying all that, uh, I am disappointing in myself that I don't know the, all the, the the pain and the suffering that that I thought I knew, and and I'm starting to see come to light. And and I think I'm ready to explore that more. I, I, I think it has to start with understanding people at a deeper level and not just as at a, you know, at a, uh, you know, friendly hello and how are you doing? I'm doing great. It has to go deeper than that. And uh, so I'm open for that conversation. I invite other people to to start having those conversations and start, you know, getting into what makes uh, what makes that pain real in, in other people's lives. Did the, the meeting Saturday that we had with the pastor's council, uh, av after you walked away from that, what was, how long those feelings last? Well, I've been thinking about it ever since, you know, I, I wrote a whole page of notes here tonight, just, you know, thinking through, you know, looking through the video, looking through, you know, various points of views on everything. And, and uh, I just, my hope is that this doesn't turn into a photo op. It doesn't turn into, you know, political haymaking, but it does. It's it's a groups a, a ground swell of of uh, grassroots people who are saying enough is enough. And uh, I'm not looking for politicians to come up with the answers. I'm looking for the real people to come up with real answers and to push the politicians to where we need to go on this. Um, I'm I got a comment here from Tara Shelton says black people have experienced trauma that has not been addressed in church because the church has not always been a place where they feel comfortable to bring it because they fear it will be spiritualized and passed on as quote, the human experience. Um, I, I, I wonder, I think we talked just a little bit about it before. Uh, you know, Mike said white pastors need to stand up I think we all need to stand up. We all need to be a voice against uh, racial injustice. Um, there, there is a fear um, that even myself over the time, there's, there's certain areas um, in life that, um, I don't know, just uh, some as a male, some as a white male, some as just a human being, that you never want to be accused of. And, you know, one of them for me is I never want to be accused of being racist. I may not understand always, and I may sometimes say the wrong thing. And that's why even doing something of this nature, you know, um, there's a certain fear uh, of saying something wrong, but is, if we let that fear grip us where we don't say anything, which is worse? Brandon, you want to address that? Yeah, um, I definitely think that fear paralyzes you. Um, and, and that's in life, period. You know, anytime you have a fear, it paralyzes you um, because you're afraid of, of what's going to happen. But then on the other side of it, it's like, well, what happens if you don't say anything? You know, what, what happens if you don't do something about it? Uh, I've obviously had a bunch of conversations about this myself and um, over the past 
eight days or whatnot and having conversations with people because they're saying that they fear that not knowing what to say or of saying the wrong thing. And they have this fear and, and fear is not of God, right? I mean, we're Christian men here, right? And, and we would say that fear is not of God and, uh, and that we would say that um, perfect love drives out all fear, right? It, it casts out all fear. And if we have the, the, the love of God inside of our heart, then, then what are we supposed to fear? What can mere man do to us, right? Um, so I think that that fear comes from a lack of knowledge and it comes from a lack of understanding. And Brother Kent, you said it, you know, you want to you wanna continue to go deeper and that's key. And as you go deeper um, and as our, our white brothers and sisters or, or non-POC, non-people of color are wanting to go deeper, the thing is, is now you take that knowledge and you do something with that as well. Um, scripture Hosea chapter four, verse six, it says that my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge, right? So, I mean, it, it's very key and very important that we don't allow the lack of knowledge to paralyze us. So then we fear of saying the wrong thing. How do you know you're saying the wrong thing if you don't say it, right? I mean, it, it, that's, the, that's the big thing. I mean, you, you, you can think that you're going to say the wrong thing, but if you're praying, if you're speaking the truth in love and you go to somebody and you're saying, hey, listen, uh, and knowing the timing of it too, timing is key. Um, you can't just go to someone right after and be like, hey, I need to know this, you know, and I, I just experienced a, a death in my family, you know, and uh, can you give me a moment to, to mourn, you know, give me a moment to mourn and we'll have this conversation. Um, but I think that's key, Pastor, and, and everybody, whoever's watching this, that, that fear paralyzes you. And I think the fear comes from the lack of knowledge. And when you have the knowledge, then it means nothing if you don't do anything with that knowledge. So people perish and people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. Well, they have four six. If anyone has a question uh, that's watching on Facebook, go ahead and uh, uh, post that and I will ask the question. But I'm going to ask everybody to unmute your mic uh, that's watching here so that we can be a little more, you know, instead of just one person at a time. Pastor, I, I, I just want to chime in here. Um, you know, the church as a whole, you know, has not taken the the front line here. The church is essential and it's not acting as essential in this matter as it all matters. You know, when we look back at scripture and we see in, you know, Jesus G, the, left the 99 and went after the one. You know, when I hear a black life matter, as a believer, we are trained that all lives matter. We are taught this in church, that all lives matter. So when someone say black lives matter, matters, it kind of, we get to be discounted by saying, no, all lives matter, because that's how it's been. But in scripture, it says the 99 were okay. He, you know, it was left on the hilltop and went after the one that was hurting, the one that was lost. And that's how God sees it. If they, and even look back at COVID-19, you know, which is still going on, but the nation shut down itself because of a small part of the population, which is the elderly, was severely being affected and dying at a higher rate, and the nation shut down. There is a pain in our nation by a small percentage of the nation, because obviously the black blacks are not the majority, the minority is not the majority in this nation, but yet the nation does not see that as a problem there, and the church seemed to be thinking the same way. You know, we're supposed to be in the world, but not of the world, the church. But many times it's been blended together and you don't see the difference, the church or the world. And I so hope that what we have started and many, I know many other churches are doing the same, are having this conversation. And after having this conversation, do we go back as what Ken said, is this something gonna be a grassroots effort? Because we can't rely upon our politicians. Politicians keep making laws to punish the crime. But when it's a heart problem, Politician can't perform heart surgery. This is when the church can. Only Jesus, only the love of God can do that. And so the church needs to continue this, but needs to go beyond the conversation. It needs to help promote the healing that needs to take place. And I'm happy that Living Water, our church, is beginning to step forward here in this community. But I pray that all churches, whether brown, black, or white, whatever color, will step forward and join together. And bring a, and put an end to this evil because that's what it is. It's darkness. It's darkness that's been in this land. 
you know, in we we have always, you know, with you know, in scripture it says, if my people who are humble who would humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways, I will heal their land. Why is God's people wicked? Is God's people wicked? Because he's saying God's, he said, my people. And we are automatically associated healing is, is because of COVID-19. That we need to claim that scripture because of COVID-19. But the pain, the, the sickness that's been in this land is decades before COVID-19. It goes back hundreds of years. As you said, Pastor, when this nation was formed, it formed on that. So it's not something with this healing of the land is going to come because it's a virus. No, it's a deep-rooted it, it needs to be uprooted and only God can perform that operation. He can uproot that darkness. I mean, this pain that I felt this weekend when I shared it, I didn't even realize it was so strong in me. I cried and I, I was like, why am I getting so emotional? It was like, I, I was like, like, and I felt, and I even told you, Pastor, I felt like I was weak, that I'm a child of God. Why am I experiencing this pain? Am I weak? And if I don't have faith that God can, can keep me and protect me and protect my family? You know, but I am also concerned about my brothers and my sisters who are out there who are also experiencing this pain and there's no voice for them. They don't know God as I do. They might not have the relationship with God as I do, but they still matters in this world. We love them too. Yeah. You see, it, 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 it is actually scary to think that we have a nation where, you know, Everybody around the world wants to come to America. And I came to America in 1983. And I tell you, I really love this country. This country has been very good to all of us. I love this country. But it, it, it really hurts. And it's a, it's a hurt that only, I think only maybe, I hope I'm not going offline, but only a black person can really understand Pastor Terry. When you see slaves come to this, this country in ships and half of them died, they were thrown off into the ocean because they were dead. And you see, once they get off that ship in this country, it's a constant survival for life. We couldn't use the bathroom that the white man used. We couldn't go in the restaurant that the white man used. We have been hosed down and hung for nothing, we have been beaten, we have been shot by authorities, the, the same authority that's supposed to be protecting us. We have been mutilated for years and years and years and there's no stopping inside. It hurts. Now, I totally don't agree with these guys going and destroying properties, but I do understand the hurt. I do understand how they feel you know, because nobody's listening. So they mm -hmm. have to do something that somebody, I've got to get somebody's attention. You know, I, I'm not agreeing with all of this burning down the churches. I mean, there's no respect for the house of God. They start burning down church. This is just wrong. At some point, the church, I believe we have enough church in this country. If we would just put our doctrine down for a minute, and just look at each other, whether you're a Chinese, whether you're Puerto Rican, Jamaican, whatever, and just begin to love each other. Mm. Because this issue that we have, we can, there's no law. There's no law that can be implemented to stop this. It's a hard issue. How yeah. can you get up as a human being and dislike somebody because of the pigmentation of their skin? It's irrational. You can't, it's, it's unreasonable. But it is an, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tool that the enemy used to divide and trying to conquer us. And now that we understand that, we need to talk yeah. about it. And get well, it let fixed. me ask a, a question. There is a question here. And maybe we'll let, uh, because Chaplain Dan's been part of the uh, police department, Mariana asked, how do you feel about the blue shield that cops have to protect each other? There is another question along that vein. It says, do you guys think the weight of the law should be harder on police officers that commit these types of actions? 
could that be a viable solution? You know, sometimes when you're a leader and you abuse your authority and your power, should the penalty for that be stronger than just a normal person? Uh, can you address that? Brother I believe Dan? I can. Um, I just want to share with my brothers as well and those that are listening in, thank you. I, I experience from my own police officers, okay, from my own kind, if you will, in New York, when I was stationed as a New York State Parkway police officer, and I was, and, uh, and those that were of New York understand what I'm talking about, out in Jones Beach, 100 degrees plus, giving two ticket books, set out and walked and said, ticket every car that is not within two lines. And no break, no anything. And after I'd done that, my uh, field training officer, who happened to be Caucasian, will come back and said, are you finished? I thought he will give me a break and no. To give me two more tickets and say, continue the job and just left. I know what it is to be told uh, in New York that um, when I was at the barracks, that um, they couldn't trust me because I didn't drink or smoke and because I was a Christian. And I didn't understand that because my job performance was well and I was doing good. And then two weeks later, I'm told, uh, we have good news for you. You're being transferred. Um, and you're being transferred and where you're going, you're gonna appreciate it. You'll fit right in like a glove, quote unquote. And I didn't understand that because I've been, I was transferred to Hempstead Valley Stream, which is predominantly African-American and Latino uh, I, in the city. A lot of people, those from New York understand what I'm talking about. It's a polarized city. You know, you have uh, Little Italy, you have where the Italians are, you have, it's, it's polarized. And then uh, when I come to Florida, and I'm told, uh, as I'm just patrolling in the community, and I'm told by an Anglo-Saxon, that I am nothing but, and he uses the N word, I am nothing but an N in a white man's world, and he decides to expectorate, spit me, and put one right in my forehead. Um, I know what it is to be told, uh, no, get me a white officer to take my report. I don't need uh, an N to do it. And I said, I'm, I'm Puerto Rican, I'm Latino. Oh, I don't need a spec to do it. I said, oh, I said, you know what those acronyms mean, by the way? And they said, no, Spanish people in charge. Um, that didn't go well. I know what it is to go into the community of black as well as Hispanic, as well as white, and hear it from all sides. Uh, and to the question about the blue shield, um, I believe that in every culture in reference to employment, there's a group of individuals that will protect themselves. There's one of the things that in the police that uh, when people say, should it be as your question? Should the penalty be severe? Definitely. Um, one of the things is that um, when there is an allegation against an officer, it happened to me, when there was an allegation of something I didn't even know I did, but just because there was an allegation, I was removed from where I was, I was put inside of a station, hidden somewhere in a wreckage room, for two weeks on just an allegation, which was not substantiated. Um, and, and because it was alleged that I probably said it and I don't even recall, um, I was uh, removed vacation pay, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there was some swift penalties, but when there is a shield is because at, when, when I started law enforcement 30 years back, there was that coach and there still is, they have this us versus them but I believe that the officers that are coming in now, because I train most of the officers, and I reminded them that they are a reflection of their community and they are to treat every individual with dignity and worth because all are created in the image of God, therefore has purpose and has worth. And if I find out that they cross a line, whatever that line is, I will be the first to make sure that they not only get reprimanded, but up to and including termination because you don't deserve to wear the shield because you are a peace officer. You are a public servant. You work for the people. They don't work for you. And within that, you still have those individuals that get weeded out. And how do they protect each other? Well, 
And most of the cities, my brother, I think Brandon is from Minneapolis. They have a union and Brandon knows uh, the, the unions there, most of the cities and states with unions. It's so sometimes so difficult because the union steps in and it defends them, even if it's a bad apple. Uh, and that's unfortunate. But when it comes to the, the, the severity, when an officer violates his trust, I was given two oaths. First, there was a civilian oath I had to take. And then the same oath that military will take, officers that join the military have to take. And one of those things was not only to protect and serve, but in that oath, it was an oath under God and a promise to him that as a public servant, my job was to make sure, even if it's to give my life, to protect the citizens. But there's an oath. And when I violate that oath, I, for me, and I, it's what I used to teach some of the young officers I used to train. There's an oath that you made before God. Therefore, that oath is much more in depth and much more meaningful than just some words on a paper. It means that you have sworn to protect and serve those individuals that might not look like you, might not be from your culture, your pigmentation, and your political persuasion, but that they are created in the image of God, have worth, have purpose. And that if you don't understand, then your job is to listen. Listen to their pain. Listen to years of hurt and understand, not just like Job, uh, I'm sure you heard from chapter 38 on the book of Job, when God speaks to Job, what does Job says at the end? He says, of hearing I'd have heard of you, I heard about you, but now I see you, now I understand. And I think what happens is there was a, officers get trained, the six months in the academy, uh, and the intense training that they get. And in that training that they're told, there's a lot of now, when I did it 30 years ago, there wasn't so much. But in reference to those questions, Pastor uh, and others, the penalty should always be more severe for those that hold public office, not only officers, but also our politicians, like in Minneapolis and others. In those cities where this happens, when you see all these, there are politicians that are there. These individuals that sworn to protect and help people of color, people in minority districts, instead, we see that I don't know how you become a millionaire on public money, but most of them do. And then it's easy. Um, I've already confronted some politicians and I said, you know, it's interesting because you individuals create a problem and then you campaign against it. Mm. Let's, wow. Um, wow. we're almost an yeah. hour. Uh, keep it going. Keep it going. We're good. Keep it going. The people are watching. Give it to I, I want to. Uh, Brandon, we good. I want to thank Pastor Brandon for having the youth join uh, tonight. I think you're yeah. streaming on the youth page as well. Yeah. Can, can I say something as well sure before can. we close? Yeah. No. Yeah. So sh shout out to Crossover Stand Up Yo Seven. Um, but we're we, yes, students. Uh, we're glad that you were tuning in, and we know that you've experienced. Some of you have experienced this. You have family members, friends that are experiencing this as well. Um, I think Pastor or Brother Mark and Brother Mike were saying this as well, you know, and everyone's saying it. We know that that racism is a heart issue, right? Um, and and you can look really good on the outside and you can have it well put together on the outside. I mean, just like Jesus talked to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you know, they were talking about, you know, wondering or worrying about them washing their hands or whatnot. Jesus followers washing their hands when he said, you worried about what's on the outside of of the plate and you worried about the outside being dirty, but yet you evildoers, the inside of your heart is filthy. And and Come I on. think that that's what's really being happened right now. And and this is something racism, and I've heard this already this past week, and, and this isn't like COVID where you can cover it with a mask, right? I mean, racism is not something you can cover with a mask and it's not gonna no. be able to be hidden uh, very long because one, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And with that, we gotta know that um, we can't be silent in that. And, um, you know, fat brother Mark said, you know, made a comment about, you know, black lives matters, all lives matters and everything. And I get it. Like everyone, everyone's saying, well, yeah, all lives matter. Get, guys, we already know that all lives matter. We get that. 
listen, that's like going to someone's funeral and yelling, hey, listen, my son was, uh, was shot like last year. Listen, we're, we're not talking about that right now. We know that your, that life matters. But what we're talking about right now is Black lives matter and Black lives can't matter. We, we, we hear this as well. Black lives can't matter or all lives can't matter, excuse me, until Black lives matter as well. Um, something that's really helped me um, you know, even in my process and, and whatnot is reading and edu continue to educate myself. And I, I would uh, encourage everybody else to do that. White people, black people, brown people, Asians, if whatever you are, to continue to read and continue to further your, your education and your knowledge in this subject. Um, there's a lot of good books out there. Um, you know, my, I got a, there's a book called Let's Start Again. Again, um, I, I get one. Do you have it? Do you have I it? do, yes. Sure. Let's start again. Listen. Let's start again. This is um, this is written by by one of my mentors, and it's talking about the race conversation. It's going to have to take place with or without you. It's going to take place with or without you. And That's if you're right. not going to be a part of it, then you're probably a part of the issue. You know, so um, just about racial reconciliation. Um, there's there's a book called White Fragility. Um, by Robin D'Angelo. Um, that's a, a great book about basically just talking about how how the white race and even um, that that background, the ethnicity, they have all these questions about what does that look like. But it says the subtitle is why is it so hard for white people to talk about white racism? Um, and then ultimately we know the scripture, right? And I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna shut up after this. I'm I'm gonna be quiet after this, right? First John chapter one, verses five through seven, and we know the scripture. And and for those that even are saying that they're men of the cloak and yet they're not mentioning this, I would really challenge that they're walking in the light. The scripture says in verse five of chapter one of first John, it says, This is the message that we have heard from him and announce it to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness if we wow. say that we have fellowship with him yet we walk in the darkness we lie and we do not practice the truth but if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light we have fellowship with one another and the blood of jesus his son cleanses us Amen. from all sin so wow. if you're saying that you're walking with jesus but yet not exposing the the the, the sinful deeds of, of of racism then i would really challenge if you're actually walking with jesus because there's no there's no way that you can walk in darkness and be in the light at the same time so amen well i said sunday uh in my sermon that we have a ministry of reconciliation and that's the ministry that christ had and christ has empowered us with the power of the holy spirit to have a ministry of reconciliation and he actually says that ministry of reconciliation or to be reconciled to one another is actually more important than worship. And that if we bring our offering uh, to the Lord, but we haven't been reconciled to our brother, we've got people that are upset with us. And I think that could go in our heart as well in our thinking and racism and all this stuff that you leave your offering. I always tell everybody, make sure you leave the offering. Don't take that with you, but you're going to leave that and, and you go fix that before you can come back and worship the Lord. So I don't know how we could worship the Lord in truth and spirit. We can fake it, but can we really worship the Lord if we have racism in our heart, if we have odd against our brother simply because someone has a different color of skin? I mean, that just makes uh, no sense to me. Uh, I would like if you've got something, maybe 30 seconds or so, you just like a little closing comment, uh, feel free, jump in and uh, and close us out. And then I'm going to have Pastor Brandon at the end to uh, close us out in prayer. Uh, you know, I, I think that uh, we got to talk about it. I mean, we've got to really more than talk about, we need to take action. And when we see injustice being done, we need to stand up for it. And I think we just like the crowd and just like the other police stood by and watched the police officer murder somebody. And, you know, I don't want to be guilty of just standing by. I, I want to stand up. I want to do something about it. And I'm committing uh, my voice to be a voice that's going to be out there. Um, not to make a name for myself, not any of that. I'm nobody. I'm just, you know, I'm the pastor here at Living Water Fellowship. We, by the way, have a very extreme multicultural church. And, um, you know, so uh, I, I'm blessed with that. 
you know, uh, it, it's just a gift from God to be part of that, to belong to this. And, um, you know, I, I don't know. I just feel like that uh, as the leader of the church, then I need to lead the way in our community. And we're going to have uh, on Let's Talk About It coming up. We're going to have uh, some pastors. Uh, we're going to get together uh, on our uh, Let's Talk About It. I'm looking, uh, Kissimmee Police Chief has already agreed uh, to meet with me on Let's Talk About It, and um, and I'm hoping to get the Osceola County um, Sheriff, which I believe we can, and Polk County as well. If I could get the three of those guys, I think that would make for a good conversation. I think we gotta we got to talk about it. we got to just bring light into these dark places and shine a light on it see it for what it is. And I think that we've got to put the light in our own heart. Sometimes we're too busy shining the light everywhere else, but when we turn it on the inside of us, we might see some things that um, is not pleasing. And we may say, well, we're not racist, but I wonder sometimes if our actions doesn't look that way. We might not be down in our heart, but because of our fear, our fear to talk, our fear to stand up, our fear to deal with this, uh, to teach the people that are around us, the lack of movement in that area can sometimes come across as we don't care. Well, I'm telling you, Living Water Fellowship cares. Everyone on this phone call right here, everyone on this Zoom meeting cares. And mm -hmm. we lend our voice to, and we say that we're standing together, arm in arm, to come against racial injustice. Amen. Anyone else want to just share a closing word, and then Pastor Brandon's going to close us in prayer. Yeah, one of the notes that I wrote down was, we've got to keep making a local noise to create a collective voice. And I think that's, you know, what I'm afraid of is this just going to die down and uh, nothing's going to change. And I don't want to have another incident. I don't want to have another report of this happening again. So how do we, how do we not lose momentum? And I think it has to start at a local level, and uh, keeping this dialogue uh, open and going, and moving it not only from understanding, but then from understanding to solutions to action. I also believe that if every church would take a, an example of what we are doing here, and begin to speak about this, not and as you say, can the uh, you know don't lose momentum, we should keep this in the forefront of our people, our congregation constantly, because this is constantly happening every day. Not because it's not on the news, we don't, so we don't hear it, it's not happening. It's yeah. happening every day all over this country. And I think as the church begin to take a lead in this and the church begin to come together with their congregants and, and we begin to stand up I do believe that we will see less and less of this because there's not a lot of wicked people out there. We have more good people in our world. We have more good policemen in our police policing than we have bad ones. We have a lot of racist people, but we also have more people that are not racist, more people that are just genuine, good human beings. And we can't take those good people and mix with all those people that are racist. You see what I'm saying? But I think the more we begin to, you know, we begin to talk about it, we begin to call it out when we see things like this, call it out. I think gradually we will start seeing the change. And not just, you know, not just black people, but all people begin to call it out, no matter what it is, no matter who it is. Any form of injustice, we see it, we call it out. And it starts, like Pastor was saying, you know, he can change the world, but he can start with his community on Sunday and his message. And I think that's the way we have to start. We have to start with what we have where we are. And once we begin to do that, then change will take place. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. You know, what Mike is saying and what Kenta said, you know, we've seen what grassroots efforts can do. Grassroots efforts is not relying upon politicians. It's not putting the weight on politicians, but it's saying, what can I do? What can I do at, with, in my position? What can I do with the circle of people that I know? How can I move the, the needle forward? How can I move this past what it is now? You see, constantly we rely upon our politicians as you know, 
the um, chaplain said, we rely upon our politicians to bring about a solution when they're the ones who are causing the problems by things they do. So why are we putting all of it on them? When we have capable, you know, those who are called by his name are powerful. They have authority in them to say, to speak to those situations, as though, you know, to bring those things into light, to bring life into a situation. We have that power, but why are we quiet? He says, you speak it. The, the world was created by the spoken word, yet the church has been silent. When you're silent, you cannot, enact, you cannot bring about a change that is effective and that will bring about a healing. But when you speak it, when you speak it forward, that's when the healing comes. And all of us, we are the church. We knew, we know that it's not the building anymore because we were closed up for months and we still had church because the church is us, each one of us. We are the church. So if we do what God has, and we said we have, there's greater authority that's in us than it's in the world. But yet we allow the world authority to dictate what we do. And going forward, if the church, if all of us will do our part, we will see, and we, we can't change the world, but yes, we can change Point Siena, we can change Kissimmee, we can change Florida. Let's start here. And if everyone do their part, if every church comes together across this nation, as my brother Brandon is saying, the, the rise up of protests across this nation, every state, even in Alaska, there's been things being, you know, every state, if this happens and the church in every state rises up, great and mighty powerful, this, this will be the year 2020. You know, we thought it was a year that we want to start over. And yet you feel like it's time we return 2020 and get a new 2020. But no, I think 2020 will be remembered for the year that healing started and it's flourishing like wildfire and it brings about a change that the government will have to take heed of what's going on. Amen. I want to invite all my, I want to invite all my brothers. Uh, for the last four years, um, the chief of every department has been um, uh, the chief here, Chief Odell, Jeff Odell, which we'll be meeting with Pastor Terry, but also Chief Gauntlet Pete uh, out of St. Cloud and Russ Gibson, the sheriff, he and I used to patrol this county back in the day, but every two months, there's been a meeting with the faith-based leaders at either the Kissimmee Police Department or at the Sheriff's Office or at the St. Cloud Police Department where you, where the pastors there had that opportunity of voicing concerns, et cetera. And this has been going on for four or five years. And I say this for the glory of God because that's one of the things that I was pushing also when Chief Leap Massey was there and said, this is very important that we have this dialogue because I reminded the chiefs as well as the sheriff, no one has a monopoly on suffering. No one has a monopoly on suffering. Mm. Everyone will suffer in their own way. Right now we're going through a suffering ourselves. When we see a, a black man that's killed and people stand around the other officers, and I thank God that they were charged, then there is something really wrong. But I want to invite you. You'll be my guest. So the next meeting is up in July. I'll let Pastor Terry know. But it's important that every other month that we come and you'll my, be my guest because it's open for the pastors and, and leaders, but that you come as well because in these departments, you have the chiefs of police. You're not talking just to an officer. You're talking to the person that could make decisions for a department, as well as the sheriff. If the sheriff can't make it, usually is a high and ranking officer, the chief deputy or one of the majors there. And it's important that they hear us. And trust me when I tell you, because I'll be at the forefront there. And because they know, they know Brandon is smiling. I know the lingo. I know, and they cannot, they cannot con, they cannot say. And I thank God that our leaders here, our sheriff and our chief, they are sensitive. They understand uh, that our community is only healed. This is my county. I love my county. I love where I live. I love this county. And, and I'm here to make sure that our young people, Pastor Brandon is, uh, Brandon is a youth pastor, I believe, but that's our generation. They need to hear 
They need to see us, the men of God. They need to see Jesus in us. We must be the examples to them what love looks like. In the midst of all this, how we're able to come together to show that Jesus says, how does the world know that we are brothers? By the love we have for one another. And what Brother Brandon said in 1 John is so true. We are the light and darkness must be exposed. And the only way darkness is exposed is when men of God rise up and they speak truth and expose that. So you are my guest every other month to come to these meetings, which is so important. God bless you. Well, thank you everyone for joining tonight on Let's Talk About It. Um, I would encourage you to share this. So once this is done and saved uh, on your social media, uh, share it. Share it on your timeline. Share it so others can see it. And let's just help spread the word. So again, thank you. Special thank you to Pastor Brandon for having the youth uh, join in with us. And uh, we appreciate everyone that is here. And thank you to, to Mark and Michael and Kent and Chaplain Dan. Thank you for uh, taking the time out tonight and just talking about it. All right. So Brandon, close us out yeah. in prayer. Yeah, let me close with the with the scripture in Matthew chapter five, verse nine. Um, it says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be children, called children of God. So if we can't make peace, um, if we if we can't make peace if we don't make conversation first and um Instead of making peace, we, we make comments. So at the end of this, let's just not make comments. Let's not just be keyboard warriors. Um, let's actually make peace um, as well. Not dreaming peace, not thinking peace. Let's make peace as well. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness and for your mercy. God, we thank you for your love, God. And we thank you, Father, that, that you are a, a God of justice, Father God. And even when, when we can't see it, Father, on this side, you are still working it out, God. You are still working on our behalf, God. And God, I pray that in the midst of this this season, God, in the midst of um, this situation, God, and with uh, systematic racism and racism running rampant right now, the, the principality of racism, God, we come against it in the name of Jesus. Amen. God, we call it out and we cast it back to where it came from, to the pits of hell, Father God. And we speak your spirit, Father God, to bring a, a spirit of unity, Father God, not division. We pray that, that you would tear down the dividing walls of hostility, God, that have been built up by racism, God. And God, we pray that you will continue to give clarity, that you will continue to give wisdom, God, that comes beyond the age, Father, but comes from you, like you gave Solomon. And God, we pray that you will continue to give knowledge as well, Father God, as those that seek knowledge, God, that you would give them knowledge and that they would take it and give knowledge to other people and teach somebody else, that each one would reach one and teach one, Father. So God, we thank you for this night. We thank you for the conversation, for the dialogue. God, we pray that it was edifying for your kingdom, God, and that the darkness will not be able to prevail against it. God, we love you. We thank you. We give glory and praise in Jesus' name, pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Good night, Thank guys. you for, for joining tonight. All right, guys. All right. Good pastor. God bless. Great. God bless everyone. God bless. God bless. God bless.